All right, so just want to welcome you all to the Missouri Aging and Disability Research Network webinar um, on universal design for living in, in place. Uh, we're joined today by Gretchen Kingma, um, and Gretchen is of Empowered Homes. Uh, she's both a realtor and an occupational therapist, um, so she kind of wears both hats and uh, brings a level of expertise in both uh, person and environment um, and how that uh, impacts health and well-being, um, as well as kind of all things real estate. Um, so she's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, universal design and aging in place and living in place um, as, as folks um, continue to, to stay in their homes. So Gretchen, thank you for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Hello. Thank you, Jessica. As, as mentioned, I'm Gretchen Kingma. I have drank, drunk, I've had a lot of coffee this morning, so we are going to be very high energy, and I hope that's okay. I'm going to share my screen, and we'll jump right in. Can somebody give me a yay if you can still see my screen? Awesome. Present. Oh, here we go. Present. Okay, so my disclaimer before we even jump in is I recognize that universal design is not a fix all for everyone. It definitely improves um, functional living and it improves the proactiveness, but I recognize that all of the agencies and people represented today, this is not going to be a one size fits all solution. So I just want to get the elephant out of the room if you're already feeling like uh, universal design. So I understand that. I'm going to give you a high level overview of empowered homes and how I marry real estate with aging in place and universal design um, concepts so that we can better serve our clients. And you will all receive a um, resource guide that my lovely occupational therapy doctoral student put together that has um, a, a ton of financial resources, as we know that finances are the number one barrier to home modifications and proactive living in place. So if we're all good there, let's jump in. Um, as Jessica said, my name is Gretchen Kingma. I'm an occupational therapist as well as a certified aging in place specialist through the HBA Home Builders Association of America. I have the executive certificate in home modification through USC's gerontology program. And then I'm a realtor. And what the heck? I went to school and, and acquired all of this OT school debt, loved the clients that I served in the rehab uh, setting as well as senior living setting. And how the heck did I get into real estate? Oh my goodness, I just jumped way ahead. Thanks for being here. Um, I'll use my keypad instead of touching the screen. My apologies. How did I get here? We're going to talk about that, but we really want to focus on today. What does, oh my goodness, I just said that I wasn't going to do that. I apologize. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. Yeah, we're not seeing the slides advance, Gretchen, if you're okay. moving them, just so you know. Yeah, I am moving them. I was moving them a lot. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> we missed that, so you're safe. <laughs> throw up. Um, let's do, I think I have to do just my presentation screen. Resume share. Are you seeing my screen? No, stop. Um, maybe my whole desktop will do it. I don't know where my, are you able to see my screen now? Yeah, we can see it in Canva. When we tested it before, it worked great. I know, and I didn't do anything different. Um, that's our fault for being so prepared. Okay, can you see that? Yes. And present. And when I click next, is my screen moving? Yes. Okay, yay. Okay, sorry about that. I, I will commit to only using the arrow. All right, so. We'll identify what universal design is. Likely most everyone on this call knows, so I'm going to breeze through those things. Again, please note all of the visuals that I use in this presentation are, are higher end homes. Universal design is super scalable, and it can be done pretty DIY with a handy contractor 
that's willing to listen and be a part of the interdisciplinary team. So I just use these photos to get the point across. It does not have to be a luxury high-end setting to achieve the universal design principles. Um, that leads me to the interdisciplinary team. This, this uh, presentation was repurposed. I just presented to some care managers who also had this, this question about how do we proactively help people live in place? And you'll see that I do change the language in my presentation because I know culture accepts aging in place most broadly, but I actually hate that terminology because it sounds like somebody is decaying where they are stuck. And so I prefer living in place. If you're, if you're curious, those are being used synonymously here. Um, so a little bit about how the heck I got here again, um, a, a passionate occupational therapist that worked in the clinical setting that now owns a real estate company, what the heck? So my bachelor's is in exercise physiology. And when I was an undergrad, I, um, care, I was a caregiver for a 96 year old woman who was a prisoner of World War II. And I loved her so much. She um, sundowned with her dementia. And I learned so much as a 21, 22 year old kid. And I knew at that moment that I wanted to work with seniors. So I went on to get my master's of occupational therapy from St. Louis University. And my jobs right out of OT school were all in the senior and adult rehab space. I have never done peds um, because I wanted to have kiddos of myself, of my own. And I didn't want to ruin that for myself. So love the older adults, love rehab. Um, in both the inpatient rehab setting and the senior living communities, I somehow got into this role of the home assessment therapist. So whatever insurance was allowing at the time, um, I would go home with, with patients before they would discharge back to the community. I would give them a laundry list of things that they needed to change about their home so that we wouldn't have a rehospitalization. And it was maddening the number of people who would come back to the rehab hospital, who would come back on a med A stay because I was only allowed to be there for 30 minutes and I couldn't follow up and they didn't have the resources or know-how. It was a huge waste of, of time and energy because there was no follow-up. And so when I went on maternity leave, I was telling my, my boss, the therapy director, I'll be back in 12 weeks. And I went home and told my husband, I am never going back there. And we have 12 weeks to figure this out. The largest problem that I see is that these people's homes don't work for them. So it's a cyclical, a cyclical thing where they keep coming back to, back to rehab, back to a med A stay or med B for um, some follow-up. And I thought, I can't, who are these people that are advocating for this client base out in the community? I'm not going to go to law school because I hate to read. And I'm not going to go back to med school because I'm still paying off the six figures of OT school debt. And I thought real estate feels like a easy entry, no offense to my real, real estate colleagues, yet also goes hand in hand with OT. If our job is to keep people happy, healthy, and thriving in the communities that they love, why are we not proactively looking at the built environment and advocating for people when they're making these big, huge changes? So that's how I got here. That's how Empowered Homes was born. Um, almost six years ago now, when I was on maternity leave, I got licensed in real estate, told everyone that I knew I'm an OT and I want to bring healthcare concepts into the housing space. So that's a very high level overview, but it, it kind of gives you a glimpse into my crazy brain and how I arrived here. So universal design, obviously going beyond ADA and why I put this on a slide all by itself is because in my business, I run into contractors, interdisciplinary team members all the time that say, I have a, a, a patient that's discharging from home. They need an ADA house, or I have a client, other realtors. I have a client that needs an ADA home. And so if there's one thing that we can all be on the same page about, there's no such thing as an ADA home. And while we all should love um, the ADA laws and regulations, it is only a start for our country. And we need to go so much further because it is only the, the codes there were only written and intended for commercial spaces. So anybody with mobility deficits will tell you, even when they're out in the community in ADA compliant spaces, 
um, that it doesn't work for them well. And so this is like the thing that I'm always educating um, other inter interdisciplinary team mates, team members on is that there is no ADA homes. So as long as we are all on the same page there, we can <laughs> move forward. Um, these are all statistics that we all, all know, and I'm not going to read them to you, but I just want it to be clear that my real estate practice and soon to be construction company, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, is, is very based in, in evidence-based data. Um, and this is these numbers are what gets me out of bed every morning. So if anybody is familiar with um, Louis Tenenbaum, he's a popular um, national level lobbyist and, and advocate for aging in place. He has a quote on his website that says, I'm paraphrasing, something like, um, it is great that, it, that, that we are doing these medical miracles that prolong people's life in the U.S. However, that we don't have housing for people to live out their prolonged years in, in a wild, wildly joyful way is a huge problem. And so that, that problem is what gets me out of bed every morning and why Empowered Homes is doing what we are doing. So let's jump into the actual features of universal design. And again, want to highlight that these are, these are extreme examples. Um, most of these photos come from homes that were built by the Gary Sinise Foundation. Um, Gary Sinise, if you don't know, was Lieutenant Dan in um, Forrest Gump, left the, the film space and started a nonprofit building homes for wounded veterans. So this is Sergeant LeGrand Strickland's home. He is a double amputee and acquired a traumatic brain injury in, in the Iraq war. And um, we'll just, I just wanna air that out that universal design is scalable. It doesn't have to be a million dollar home. So. Anybody want to yell out what you see here on, on this home, just so I'm not talking at you, but rather with you, what do you see on the exterior of this home that could be considered um, great features for our clients that might be aging in place or living with disabilities? Well, of course, the flat sidewalks attached to the driveway. And I love the, uh, the slanted roof because I'm thinking that's just going to keep the rainwater from coming on to uh, the sidewalk down below and the porch. So I love that. Amy, thanks for raising your hand. Um, okay. So I love the, the fact that you really, you can't really tell what is accessible or what isn't accessible. It's just that it looks like a beautiful house that um, based on the topic of this presentation is probably also universally designed. Amazing. I appreciate you pointing that out. And when I was an adjunct professor at SLU teaching these concepts, that's exactly what I, maybe it's because I'm a mom of toddlers, but I would say it's hiding the peas in the mashed potatoes. Like you're hiding the non-sexy accessibility features into functional, beautiful design. So thanks for saying that. One thing I like to point out in this photo is, is really the OT side of things. Um, the, the flagpole, most flagpoles are out in the middle of the yard and you have your light on the flag, but they used a super client tailored, client specific approach here because while Sergeant LeGrand Strickland is super mobile with his prosthetics, it is much easier to, um, to raise and lower a flag when it's incorporated in your sidewalk there. So that, that is kind of, that was my favorite feature. And then um, Deb, to what you were saying, a covered front entryway to keep people out of the elements when they're getting ready to go, or if you have visitors, a, a drop zone, a covered drop zone to help that transition from outside to inside. And then one thing, the double doors, you can't see it in the picture, but it does have smart home um, functionality where his phone knows when he's approaching his double doors and then they just automatically open. And then those big log handles, which we see as um, super modern and trendy, actually very functional because my three-year-old can open that door the same way that's a seated person, somebody in the seated position, as well as somebody with a walker, cane, or, or wheelchair could. So um, the, the top to bottom door handles that have the enclosed D style ring, super functional. 
Another thing you can't see in this photo, the garage was raised. So there are zero steps to get in from the front entryway as well as the garage, which is a super simple, not highly, um, not an, a huge increase when you do it from the beginning of construction. It's just a grading issue. Um, so I don't, I don't know why builders won't just do that, have one entryway that is zero step, but that's for another presentation. <laughs> What do you see here in this bathroom? This is moving into their primary bathroom. Oh, goodness. So we have visual contrast, um, the white against the black tile. We have a roll under sink so that you could be in a, in a seated position, or if you have a walker, you can get up nice and close. Um, I like the alternating vanity. Again, not, not thinking just wheelchairs, but if you have someone that is a walker user and has some kyphosis, they can stand at the sink comfortably and not have to strain um, or lose their balance and have a fall while doing their, their morning routine. I like that the mirror on the left is a little bit larger than the mirror on the right. It's hard to tell unless you're looking, but that helps somebody shave their face. If, if, if you hang two mirrors that are the same height, one person is, is the person in the seated position is not gonna be able to shave their face without cutting themselves. Um, so it's little things like that, uh, lever style uh, faucets, I know you can't tell in the picture, but those floors are actually heated. Again, that's more of a luxury feature, um, but because he has problems regulating his body temperature and is a younger guy that uses his upper body strength, he likes to scoot along the floor um, because he finds it good, good exercise and it allows him to have that independence with his showering and bathing task. And that's another example of why our approach is so holistic because some people might come in and say, well, you, you can just wheel yourself. Like when you take your prosthetics off, wheel yourself to your shower, transfer to your bench. And he says, no, I, I want to get there on my own. And I don't want the wheelchair in the bathroom. So we did heated floors so that he could push himself along the way um, and not be freezing cold. So that's why there's really no way to create a code book, if you will, when using universal design, because it should be um, a very tailored client-centric approach. Equitable use. This is a design that's marketable to people with diverse abilities. The thing I wanted to point out here, of course, we still have the visual contrast. We have the seat. Um, I don't love the tile that they chose because it's very hard if somebody has low vision like myself um, to find that seat, but client-centered, they chose it. There are grab bars located here and here, as well as on the far side of the tub so he can lower himself. That is not going to be a good setup for 95% of seniors because of crepitus and arthritis in the upper extremities, but the client-centered tailored approach for him, that's what works. Um, you, you might notice the faucet placement. That's a super simple modification that you can make if somebody is going in and, and redoing a bathroom or updating their sink or countertop, putting the faucet, just, just working with a plumber to move the water so that it's more accessible and that decreases fall risk and um, injury risk tremendously. The big thing I wanna highlight here that is super scalable is the tile. Um, you will see it is the same exact tile as the rest of the floor, but they cut it in smaller cuts. The reason being is that smaller cuts, smaller pieces, means more grout and more grout means more friction. So this is a really easy way to not increase costs tremendously, to decrease fall risk when doing a bathroom renovation. Um, just pick out smaller tiles so that you get more grout. Another thing that I'm sure a lot of you know, um, but tile has what's called the DCOF or a COF, which stands for dynamic coefficient of friction and coefficient of friction. And if you walk to Home Depot or Lowe's and look on, on the boxes of tile, you will learn that anything close to one is, is gonna be a, a lesser fall risk. They're gonna be more um, higher friction. So 
if you have anything 0.5 to one, that's going to be favorable for somebody that that wants to mindfully age in place or somebody that has neuropathy in their feet um, or any other poor sensory issues. Um, so the coefficient of friction is a big one when looking at tile choices. And that's something so simple um, that a lot of people just don't ask and they pick off of um, what they like and what they like might be disastrous in the bathroom. So just a way of how we're bringing that um, real estate and housing knowledge, pairing it with the healthcare knowledge and serving our clients when, when doing home modifications. This house is a lower price point and it was for sale by owner um, about three years ago. And when I saw it, I thought, I wonder if these people are so intuitive in using universal design or if they just liked the design. So I reached out to the owner. They had no idea what universal design was. They just said that they built a home that would work for them and their small children. And so I think that's a really cool takeaway. Um, similar to Amy's point, it just is more functional. So this is an example of flexibility and use. We all see kitchen islands at homes that we visit or at our own homes as being one level. And maybe sometimes here on the backside, it will be um, alternating height so that benches can pull up. But I love that they did a, a very, a very different design in making this portion an island and this an integrated kitchen table. So if you have a, a wheelchair user, it's super simple to pull that chair back and include them. If, if everybody's standing around eating charcuterie, drinking wine before whatever event, um, it's very easy to include everybody around this island. Or on the flip side, if you're dying Easter eggs coming up, um, your, your kiddos can climb right up and, and access the island very simply. So this is an example of flexibility and use. This is not a picture of a pretty pillow. It's actually a picture of the Nest thermostat. And I used it as an example for simple and intuitive use because I read this fascinating article that Nest modeled their thermostat off of the old Honeywell thermostat, which is a great example of universal design and simple and intuitive use because many seniors will remember the, if you turn to the right, it gets hot. If you turn to the left, it gets cold type of thermostats. The ones that they, that they created and launched in the 90s and 2000s that you have to press buttons up, press buttons down. You can barely see the numbers on the screen and you don't know if your heat's on or you're, and you got to toggle the switches, not simple nor intuitive. So this is an example of, of a product that is built with simple and intuitive use, not to mention the high visual contrast with the big bold number against the black background. Perceptible information. I love this picture because I found it on Pinterest and um, it looks like just a modern trendy address number plate, but it actually is a really good picture of perceptible information. And that is when the design communicates necessary information despite a person's abilities. And I use this as an example, especially for seniors, because it's so important that their houses are um, very visually and well marked so that friends, family, them, if they're out and about at night can find their way. So this helps with wayfinding. It helps with emergency response. If somebody has a fall, um, I live in a subdivision that has no street lights, and I'm very embarrassed to say you cannot read the numbers on my house. So every time I give this presentation, I tell myself I need to do something about that. If we had an emergency, it takes a bit uh, for people to find our house. So this is an example of perceptible information. Tolerance for error. This kitchen is um, the kitchen of Miss Colleen Star, uh, I'm sorry, Starkloff. And it is, I'm using the example of her induction cooktop for tolerance of error, because as we know, induction doesn't burn you. If you touch it, it only heats up the contents of the pot. So that's a really, um, they're becoming a lot more affordable actually, and a little bit more mainstream. So if you have a senior that really loves to cook, but maybe they have had um, some strokes or they just have poor motor and upper body control, that's a really good, a good feature to help somebody decrease risk um, when cooking. I guess I should highlight uh, the other features here just while we're at it. Again, faucet placement, that's a really like scalable, it doesn't have to be luxury quartz countertops, but you can have a plumber move a faucet quite simply um, if, you're, if you're putting a new 
Vanity in or even buying a vanity off the shelf at Lowe's, Menards, anything like that, so that somebody in a seated position can access the faucet um, more simply. And then I love the receptacle and the countertop to the front of the um, toaster there. We see that in commercial spaces a lot. I have no idea why we don't do it more in residential spaces where you just hit the hit the receptacle and it comes up so you don't have to reach all the way to the wall to plug something in. I know that I'm flying through these and it's intentional so that we can have a conversation at the end. Um, so we have two more. This is low physical effort. I like this example because Chip and Joanna Gaines have really jaded our generation. And this is one of the things that they made really popular that my OT heart loves, the barn door. When done properly, not um, DIY off the shelf, but when, when a contractor helps build a barn door, you can open and close them with super low physical effort. And it also decreases uh, swing. So it keeps floor space open for walker, cane, wheelchair users, or somebody that has an assist when walking. So I really love the barn door um, or pocket door, but this is a little bit more affordable, more doable than a pocket door. And then our last feature of universal design, size and space for approach and use. And this is just looking at um, aisleways, entryways, hallways, making sure that there is adequate space for reaching, manipulation, et cetera, for, for whatever the user's posture, mobility, or any um, items that they might be using for mobility. So those are our seven features of universal design. It is a no brainer, but who does universal design benefit? And that is everyone. And so I wanna talk a little bit about interdisciplinary team and our approach. I shared this before you all jumped on with Shardana, but um, Empowered Homes, my company, currently is myself, another OT who came from WashU, um, and we are, we serve a large um, variety of clients with home searching and home modification. And the two largest barriers that we run into daily when helping people live in place is that funding piece. And because construction is so expensive and people are, are not found to do the work and materials have skyrocketed. So we recognize that funding and the interdisciplinary team as a, dare I say, a woman occupational therapist we get a lot of pushback from the contractors that we do work with. Um, it's very hard to have a seat at the table as a female from the healthcare space in construction, as you might imagine. So because of that, myself and another WashU OT, um, Tiffany Dill, if anybody, if, if anybody knows her, we are launching a construction side of our business which our long-term goal is to be approved for the Medicaid waiver. Um, Tiffany is already approved with the VA for their home modification programs. And she's doing a really awesome project right now for a veteran um, doing a kitchen and bath remodel. So our launch date is June. We're, we're building this, this out, but come end of May, early June, Empowered Homes will truly be an end-to-end -end solution for housing needs. And then Chelsea, our, uh, our other amazing occupational therapist, who's our director of operations, she's going to be kind of the go-to while I run the real estate side of the business and Chelsea, or Tiffany runs the construction side of the business. Chelsea is going to marry those two and, and kind of is the bulldog with grace. When somebody has funding issues and they need to find a solution, Chelsea does not take no for an answer. We go out and we find we find a solution. And so um, that is that is where we are going and how we hope to serve more people in the St. Louis and greater area. But that is that came from struggling on the interdisciplinary team because we all know. Um, as holistic practitioners and um, agency representatives, that the more the more heads serving our client, the better for our client. But as mentioned, the the roles in which we work with on a day to day basis are just not very open to universal design or um, collaboration. So we decided to start a thing and and do it on our own. So um, soon to come is empowered construction as well as Empowered Homes. So any questions about the interdisciplinary team members? I've 
I told you I drank a lot of coffee. We flew through a lot of the concepts. Any questions at all? So I have some case studies on how, oh, Amy, question. Um, I am wondering, this is, we are trying to put together um, like a home modifications program. So are you primarily just working with folks who are purchasing something new and then making modifications? Or if we have someone who needs a modification, um, when you have your construction company, will you be doing those? Yes, absolutely. And that's because we see a need. Um, we get asked probably five times a week. Uh, we want home, we want a home, we need a ramp. We need a, a zero barrier shower. We need X, Y, and Z so that we can live in place. And finally, our contractors were just too booked. They didn't, it just wasn't going smoothly as being the referral source. Sure. So yes, the construction okay. team will be doing existing homes and then we'll have the, the real estate side just in case that moving makes better sense. But I one thing I wanna stress is that what sets us apart and what I value as, as an occupational therapist is that whole picture. So while we know it's not realistic for people's budget all the time to do the beautiful universal design or somebody's in crisis because they were just diagnosed with a, degener a degenerative disease or maybe they're coming out of rehab. We want to be able to deliver a really quality renovation really fast, but we wanna also take the whole picture so not just looking, not just throwing grab bars up to throw grab bars up, but hearing out the goals of the individual. How long do you intend to be in the house? How can we treat this as a um, an improvement to your property as some people's home is their largest asset? So thinking of the financial barriers and benefits as well as the whole estate is, is the mindset in which we serve our clients. Great, thank you. Yeah. So this gentleman here, Mr. Canetto, was referred to me by the ALS Association. So I just want to give the disclaimer before I share the video. It was a marketing video, so it's very cheesy. Forgive me. Um, yet the process here is exactly what you see on the right. He reaches out. He says, my ALS is getting bad. We have to move tomorrow. I said, do you really need to move tomorrow? Can I please come and meet you and your wife? And let's see what option is best for you. He sees his function getting worse and, and feels the, the weight of having his wife, the burden of care that his wife is providing for him. I go, I do the client interview from an occupational therapist perspective, the whole occupational profile, and I gather that he and his wife really want to stay in their, in their place. They don't want to move, but they think that they have to. I, I asked the, the wife mid-interview, what if we could create a space that worked for, for Mr. Phil and you guys could stay here? And she just starts bawling. She's like, nobody, nobody's told us that that's an option. So before we had the construction entity ourselves, we would bring in contractors, we would work together, they would give a couple of bids for a couple of varying options, and then I would oversee the project through, through finish. So that's what this video is going to show. Um, replace the outside builder, and that is, what, that is what we'll be able to offer. It's what we are offering right now, but we're just not launched to the client facing eye yet. And I'll fast forward through some of the cheesy parts to save us all. Like this. And previous to becoming a real estate professional was an occupational therapist. I would help people after a traumatic life event get back to living um, and doing the things that they wanted and needed to do. When I heard that I have ALS, I mean, obviously in the first minute, you know, a lot of things go through your head. ALS has affected my arms up to this point, most significantly, to the point that I can't raise them up to normal heights. I lo love to cook and I played a lot of pool. I mean, I would maybe spend 
four to five hours a day, either practicing or playing. Once the arms started to get a little weak, I, I had to quit that. I joined the ALS Foundation very quickly after I was diagnosed. They uh, recommended or pointed out that Gretchen was was good at uh, helping folks, you know, figure out what to do from the point of view of a either a new home or potentially upgrading uh, their existing home. I did my research, I went and heard their needs, and then we established a plan for, for what made sense for their family. So I met Gretchen uh, a couple of years ago, and she brought to me an idea of how she was going to bring occupational therapy or her occupational therapy background into the real estate market. And in turn, I would be able to help her on the construction side if she had clients that needed uh, remodels completed or home built uh, for certain needs of her clients. So if anyone is uh, thinking about either relocating or remodeling, uh, I would definitely- Blah, blah, blah. Okay, here's the cool part, the bathroom. So we at Compass Design Build, we have become passionate about universal design. Yes. We're working with the Starkloff Disability Institute to help promote universal design. Uh, Compass is also a part of the IDA, the Inclusive Design Alliance, to help promote and educate universal design throughout St. Louis. We were limited in space in this bathroom, so we designed the shower specifically across from this vanity without a shower door and only a curtain so that we have a larger turn radius. Uh, we were able to get a turn radius here using the rolling shower floor to access the vanity. I asked for a short, small cabinet next to the main counter that would have a lower top that would be right about at the level of my arm when it's dropped down and he accommodated that. So I now have a, a place that I can easily reach in various things that I would normally put up on a higher counter. We also moved the faucet to the left side of the sink instead of the rear of the sink. Uh, this makes it easy, much easier. And I just want to point out um, that the vanity top, so that vanity was built from scratch with think pieces right off the shelf at Lowe's. So it looks really nice. And the cultured marble top is like the lowest grade that you can get. And in my opinion, I think it looks really nice. So just an example of when you have a builder or a contractor that's willing to listen to here are, here's what we know about his physical client's physical function and his disease process. He, we need it to look like this. Pete is a really great builder. Um, and he, he took what we shared from a healthcare perspective and then built it very affordably um, to bring it to life. So I just wanted to point that out, that it's not granite countertops, it's not quartz, it's, it's all of those materials are like builder grade right off the shelf from a big box store. For him to be able to turn the sink on and off. We felt good about Pete. And so we, uh, we decided to, to go with Pete and we're happy that we did. I'm not like any other agent that blah, 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 blah. I think, I think those are the main features. One thing no, to I... highlight is the trench drain. Um, I wish more contractors used the we trench drain. We took on this project right. knowing that uh, his needs may change uh, in the future. Well, I won't dizzy you but the trench drain is the long strip drain instead of the center and they slope the floor ever so mildly um, to move the water away from the center so if you do have somebody that is standing for their showering task or somebody that's aging that is a really great way paired with the smaller tiles to decrease fall risk in the bathroom so that is the first example of somebody that we modified. This case study is looking at a hybrid approach, somebody that bought a house and modified. This one hits home because it is my parents. Um, my father was diagnosed with stage four cancer in 2020 at the young age of 57. And um, they lived in a two-story home that they raised my, my sister and I in. And it's funny how the good Lord prepares you to serve people in your midst because this is what I do for a career and never did I think I'd have to do it for my parents. But I share this because it is such a great example of 
a normal real estate professional would look at this house, take one glance at this house and say, no way, Jose, you told me that you're moving to eliminate stairs. And this has a ton of stairs to get to the top of it. Yet, because A, I knew the, the clients pretty well, but B, did an extensive interview. I knew that an in-ground pool was of the utmost importance to them and that a walkable community was going to be important for when Mr. Buyer was deceased and Mrs. Buyer would be by herself. So, so looking at first glance, no way would this work, but I just pulled up Google Maps and realized that the grade of the lot increased as it went back towards the backyard. And so what used to be here before my parents bought the house was a teeny tiny little um, wood pad. And I told, I, I sent this over to my mom and dad and said, I know it, it not what you were looking at. It was areas that they weren't looking at. It's in Webster Groves, but it's way below your, your highest budget that you've budgeted for a new home. What if we tore out this little dinky porch and built a really nice outdoor living space because I know Mr. Client loves to be outside and he's approaching end of life. So why not create an oasis where he can enjoy his last years and let's integrate a ramp, a sloped um, ramp so that he, he can get into, and this is their primary bedroom right here. So double doors and they were able to buy a home that was way under their budget we interviewed four different contractors. They did this addition for approximately 25,000 and had bids all the way up to like 100,000. So it's all about just networking, getting the, this is what we need across to the contractors and getting the best bid for the client. And we increased the property value a ton. I don't have exact numbers, but as far as it being a tailored option for the client, I will tell you, my dad sat out here every single day. We put heaters. He was out here until the bitter end. He passed away in November of this past year. But right before he passed, my younger sister was able to get married in, in a backyard wedding so that dad could be present. And they actually used the ramp as the aisle. Um, so it was a beautiful. It was the last day that he walked ever in his life. He used a rollator to walk down his sloped ramp to walk his daughter down the aisle. So like my OT nerdy brain um, just exploded because it, it's such an example of universal design and how it is a flexible use of the space. Not everybody's gonna have a backyard wedding, but that was like the ultimate. So then this, the third case study, we had mod home modification. We had a hybrid where we helped a client buy a home and modify. This is just, just a home purchase. And it was a 62 and 65 year old couple. Husband had Parkinson's, so they wanted to come closer to home. And the first home that they loved and they wanted to buy, we got into a real life fight because husband was early onset Parkinson's, was not using um, a mobility device, looked to the, to the normal eye like a rock star. You would not know that he had Parkinson's unless you treated Parkinson's a lot as a clinical OT. And so the first house that they wanted to write an offer on had been rehabbed, updated, but every single room had a different flooring type. So not only did that add transitions from each room, it also added visual input that was a hot mess. And so I had to have the hard conversation of, I know right now, Mr. Buyer is, is doing great and we are so grateful for that. Yet what we know to be true about Parkinson's disease is as it progresses, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not three years from now, but who knows when, these transitions are going to cause a huge fall risk, even though they're ever so slightly and the, the visual input of all of the carpet here and the tile here and the um, LVP in this room is going to cause his freezing episodes to, to heighten potentially, which will then increase fall risk even more. So they appreciated it. They almost fired me as their agent. And I had to remind them, it is my job to be brutally honest so that you're set up for success down the road. This is the home that they went with. It only has two steps to enter. It has double door entry. So I was able to educate them that if down the road you need a sloped entry, a zero step entry or a ramp, this is going to be far more easily modifiable, far more affordable 
than something that has three, four, five steps to enter. And it had this wood floor continuous throughout the whole entire first level, even the main floor bedroom. And then the bathroom was tile, but they used reducers and there was no transition strip. So I share this one because at my father's funeral, they came and um, the wife was saying, you have no idea how much you have impacted us. Mr. Byer now uses a walker just two years later. And they said, we don't know what we would have done if we bought that house that, that we sat across the table and argued you on. So this is an example of how really bringing that OT knowledge base into the home buying process is changing how somebody is living in their, in their home for the long term. So that's all I have for you. I would love to have a conversation. I see the chat. Oh, it was a, a direct message. I will connect with you. Um, most definitely. So this is um, where we are going. Right now we have Empowered Homes. Our mission is to deliver the joy of home without barriers. And then Empowered Construction is coming so, so soon. We hope to get that Medicaid waiver so that we can serve people across the entire socioeconomic um, span. If you have questions, this is a um, flyer that Chelsea put together, the amazing Chelsea. If you want to scan the QR code, it's just a little PDF um, to have more information. We do do living in place assessments. Unfortunately, as to not get our wires crossed with, with Medicare, those assessments are predominantly for people who are looking in the future um, to modify their homes to live in place. We can't do home safety assessments post discharge because that is a Medicare billable um, service and we are not Medicare providers. So that's just a little bit on logistics, but I would love if anybody has questions. I hear some of my references for the presentation. I am an open book, um, very honest. So if you have questions, let's hear them now. I put everyone to sleep. Great. <laughs> We have some uh, question in the chat. Um, oh. I think uh, one is, do you see yourself becoming a Medicare provider? That is a great question. I was just telling Sherdana before everybody jumped on that I need to hire about five or more people if I want to maintain my marriage and be a mom. Um, yes, I do. I do see that. I, I think that makes great sense for the level of impact that we decide that we desire to to drive um i would say it's probably not until q1 of next year that we can attack that goal you had also had some funding um things um there was a slide about funding opportunities that you used yes so I believe you all are going to attach an amazing 24 page resource that my awesome um, OTD student who's in the room created. And that is, that is a large part of what our team does is get creative because um, a lot of times we are just told no. And there are so many, there are so many grants and programs out there they just make them near impossible to find um, and to apply for and to get those dollars. So that resource is free to you. Compliments of Danielle. I will not take any credit for it. Um, and also an example, so, some things that I always ask or encourage people my age, get yourself a long-term care policy. There are so many really awesome long, long-term care benefits. And a lot of seniors don't even know that they have them. Um, they paid into it way back when, when they were setting up all of their life stuff, and then they just don't know. So that's one thing we can do is, is dig into those policies, reach out to the providers, ask what their benefit is for home modifications. Um, a lot of times they require an occupational therapy or some, uh, something similar to demonstrate medical necessity. Um, so while I don't have like a, here's your golden ticket for funding, we do have that resource for you as well as letting you know that that's something we are not afraid to, to get, roll our sleeves up and get dirty. Um, I have an example real time. 
we had this marvelous couple that wanted to move to St. Louis. Both are wheelchair users. One has muscular dystrophy. The other acquired a traumatic brain injury in 1992. His insurance, he had a bucket of money from his accident that grows every year and he had never used it. And um, Tiffany and I, my business partner and I, searched long and hard for a buildable lot here in St. Louis. They ended up landing in North Carolina, which we were able to facilitate. We interviewed all the builders, all the architects. I helped them acquire the land in North Carolina to build. And their insurance company has never, ever, ever funded um, new construction with those dollars. But because of Tiffany and I, passion for getting people what they need and our ability to document medical necessity. Um, a large part of their new construction home is being covered by those insurance dollars. And it was just asking questions. What, what, how can this work? This is, this is the client's need. It's there. You're telling us it's for home modification. They're building a home that it shouldn't be that hard to like make these pieces work. And so we're happy to, to dig through the red tape of insurance and different grant programs on behalf of our clients. Well, I attach the um, document you sent about the funding sources. So if anyone is interested in that, it's, it's there in the chat. You can download it. It's super thorough. <laughs> Any other questions for Gretchen? This is kind of a um, lame, I wouldn't call it like, it's very hard to talk about yourself. So I started this Facebook group, if anybody is interested. And the reason being is because as a real estate professional, other realtors are always reaching out to me. They, they think that I have this like pocket full of accessible homes for sale that doesn't exist. So I started a Facebook group just called Accessible Homes for Sale. So if you ever have a client that is making a move or a client that is unfortunately needing to sell their home, it's a great place to, to get it out there because there is, there is such a need. I, I'm sure you're all familiar with the most recent HUD research um, and the lack of accessible homes that exist in the US, but that's one way to connect and hear of other needs or haves. Um, I've had some people match, you know, past DME that, that they were getting rid of and they wanted to donate, or I just had someone message me that they were selling at a very, very, very reasonable price, um, a handicap accessible minivan and so ad adapted minivan. So if you wanna connect from like a community level, on Facebook, it's just called Accessible Homes for Sale. And is that just in St. Louis or is that? I left it very vague. The okay. um, be reason being is we offer accessibility consulting to other realtors. So where if, if you ever hear of somebody in Chicago or Kansas or Florida that has a client with a mobility um, deficit. I work side by side with them and then the agent pays me a referral. So it's free to the client. Um, but I basically am an advocate for the client and finding, finding a home that will be easily modifiable, easily tailored to their needs down the road in the here and now. Um, so it's, it's open to national, open to Kansas city, Jeff city, any, anywhere. Jess, do you have anything you want to add? No, I just thank you so much for joining us and for sharing all of your knowledge and your experience and um, creating those networks and systems. So I think it's it's a great thing to have when we all sort of think the same way, but um, getting folks all kind of pulled together and being able to, to share what we found has worked or any resources is, is super helpful. So thank you again for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Sorry for the couple of tech glitches. Nah, we got it, got it worked out. <laughs> yeah. And if, um, if you'd like, we're, we're going to send a follow-up email with the link. Um, we can also include the funding sources table, maybe a link to that Facebook group you were talking about. If you want to receive that follow-up email um, and we don't have your email, just leave your email in the chat and we'll get that out this week. So.
Thank you all, all right. for joining us as well. Yeah, thank you.